And we're recording again. Okay, so hello and welcome back. So in the last couple of little videos, we've taken a summary data set or a dummy data set. So it's not actually a dummy data set, it's real data. I, I spent time in the field gathering up all those fish and invertebrates and chopping them all up and running them through the mass spec. And we've got, the, we've got those data. And we've sort of done our an initial plotting and things like that. And we've got some sort of inferences about what that we can say that there's different things happening in the two lakes. Yeah. But we want to sort of understand what they are from a from an ecological perspective. And in order to do that, we need to start using some of the some of the different tools that we sort of discussed in the lectures in class. And the first of these is a, a simple mixing model and because it kind of follows with this part of the um, of the analysis, we're going to do a simple calculation of trophic position at the same time. A lot of how this is done is taken from a, a seminal paper from David Post in the early 2000s that we will have talked about in class, no doubt. Um, and essentially what we're going to do here is just apply that uh, two source, two end member mixing model. Um, defined by post to the data set that we've been working on. And again, we can do all of this in basic or stuff. We don't need any super duper mixing models or anything like that to do it. And I like to do this because there's a couple of reasons I still like to do this, and we probably will discuss this in class. The first is that it's quick and it's simple, and you can, if you like playing with your data in Excel instead of or, you can do all of this in Excel. Even. The other is it sort of makes you go through your data step by step and figure out you should you should already you should have an idea of what your models are going to tell you just by looking at the data. Yeah, and this sort of brings you through that process step by step rather than getting a load of data, throwing it into Mixer and just reporting what comes out. You need to understand what you're doing to make to understand that you're doing correctly. I guess. The other nice thing about this approach is that it gives you data for each individual organism. Each individual organism you run through, you can estimate resource use, and that's really useful if you want to do mixed effects modeling and things like that further down the line, where you've got 30 samples from, from different lakes or different marine systems or whatever it is that you happen to be, to be working on. Okay, so we're going to run through that now. I'm going to start sharing my screen. We're going to do this the same way we did the last time. And fingers crossed, we'll all continue to work. And we will be all good. Okay, so here we are back and exact. Like I said, we've only scrolled further down the page here. We're moving forwards in terms of the, the topics that we're dealing with. But in terms of what we're actually doing, in terms of what we're actually doing, the um, everything will still sit in the same markdown file. All, all the text and all the script is all together, and there'll be a, a single summary of this generated that you can take and use for for your analysis. So we know that. The isotope ratios are different between the species. We know that they're different between the lakes, but we don't really know. We can't say too much about what's causing this right now. And to do that, as we sort of discussed in the class, what we need to do is to look at the isotope ratios of the consumers in the context of the isotope ratios of the various potential sources. And to do that, the first thing we need to do is to get a handle on what the isotope ratios for the particular sources are. And again, we're going to run through this using a very straightforward and described it previously model by, by post. And in this, we just have single values for the sources. We don't have, like we will in the, the Bayesian models, we won't be able to put error estimates around those. So how do we, first of all, how do we get these? Well, we're interested predominantly primarily in pelagic benthic pelagic or littoral resource use. Doesn't necessarily mean that the consumer is feeding in that habitat, but it means that's where they're getting their energy from those two distinct primary production pathways. So first we need to decide what is going to be our 
proxy for, for each of those. And we had zooplankton I mentioned earlier. So we've got zooplankton. So zooplankton will be our pelagic end member. And benthic invertebrates sampled at one meter, one meter depth will be our littoral end member. So we can sort of pull out that data using some of our summary functions here. If we want to say end member summary. So here we've got QV, BMI, zero meters, one meter, two meters, so on, and zooplankton as well. So we want to essentially pull out the carbon and nitrogen data for those two end members and create, turn that into a, um, its own data frame. I've done this by just typing it out here, basically, and then merge that onto our other data set. OK, so what we're going to do then is essentially if we click all of this, and you'll see over here we've created a new thing here called MM data. And if we have a look at that, it's essentially it's data. Yeah, it's the same data tab that we had before, but we've added a few new columns. We've got delta 13C pelagic, delta 15N pelagic, delta 13C littoral, and delta 15N littoral. All in there as, as columns, and that's associated with those values that we saw in each lake. If we switch from Lake Kiwi, no, I'm not going to scroll down to it, but you can take my word for it. When we switch down to Lake Kiwi to Lake Vuontas, those values will shift to reflect the, the different lake. So we've talked about this mixing model before. This is how we code it. Essentially, what we're talking about here is mixing model data pelagic. And again, what we're doing here is we're just creating another column on our, our data frame, our MM data now called PEL for pelagic, essentially pelagic resource use. And that's 13C value minus 13C littoral divided by 13C pelagic minus 13C littoral. We're looking at the difference, the distance between the consumer 13C value and the littoral M member as a function of the distance between the pelagic M member and the littoral M member. We want to click that in and run. Let's go and then we can look back over our MM data. And we see here that we've got estimates of pelagic resource use for each of these samples. And we can sort of plot this out and have a look at our estimates of resource use. Let's see how this is going to look. Scroll down, just the fact that she's below the proper. Okay. And kind of as we would have expected, we've got similar estimates of pelagic resource use in Lake Kiwi. And in Lake Vontas, we see that there's separation whereby LSO whitefish are using more pelagic resources than perch. OK, so now we're getting to a point that we're making ecological observations from our isotope data. I want to draw your attention to something here, though. We've got values down here in negative 0.4, and we've got values here above 1. So this should be scaled between 0 to 1, but we've got values that are outside of that range. And the reason we have that is because we took a very coarse end member. We took zooplankton and the total end invertebrates at 1 meter and didn't put any estimate of resolution, any estimate of error around that. So it's not surprising that we have some fish that fall outside of that scale, of that outside of that band between zero to one. So what do we do? How do we handle it? Well, there's a couple of different ways you can handle it. You can you can incorporate it, you can keep it and say this is relative to our, our baselines. Or if you want to tidy it up, and if you look in the literature, you'll see people have done this different different ways and provided you're up front and acknowledge the assumptions and the problems of, of what you're doing. Either approach is, is acceptable in, in, in my view at least. I may, I may be biased. Um, so what we might want to do, what a lot of people will do is they'll correct this to a, they bring this to a zero to one scale. So essentially what we're saying here is we're creating a new column called PEL core, which is and then data PEL. And then we're saying within this PEL core, anything that's less than zero, call it zero. And anything that's greater than one, call it one. So we have a look at that. Click that, let it run. 
go back into our NN data and we see now where we've got PEL. See here we have negative values here of minus 0 0.1 and that's gone to 0. We should have values down here 1.5, 1.1, 1.3 are all gone to 1. So essentially we're just bounding this in a, on that 0 to 1 scale. We can plot that up and see how it looks. And nothing doesn't doesn't change anything too much. Yeah. The um, estimates of in Lake Kivi, we still have a lot of overlap. In Lake Volantis, we still have separation based on plethora of plagic resource use. But again, here we're bounded now between zero and one. So always worthwhile if you're reviewing papers or looking at people's work, just check how they handle that. Yeah. And you can go back up and we talked about the um, how we got the summary data for the, the mean and standard deviation of um, carbon and nitrogen isotope ratios earlier. You could take these data, go back to that initial script or the earlier in the script and plot this through or run that through and say, OK, well, what's the mean and standard deviation of um, or standard error, whatever you're interested in using of um, Pelagic resource use for these two species. You can then plug that into a, an ANOVA or a GLM or whatever analysis you're using to analyze your data. Essentially, what you have is a single value that reflects pelagic resource use for that individual consumer. And that's a really powerful thing to know. It's a really useful thing to know. You can use it a lot in different types of uh, different types of analyses. It's not as easy to get that information from and we talk we'll talk a lot more about this from the, the from the Bayesian models because you're looking at things based on populations and distribution within the population. So you get really good values for really good estimates of, of that population, but maybe not so much for those individual values for those individual data. Points. So yay, the first mixing model. Huh? So um, the next thing I want to do, and you'll see here now where this kind of follows through and it's not really worth stopping and starting a new video for this, is that we can estimate trophic position here. Um, and we'll talk more in a subsequent video about using the uh, trophic position package to get a, a Bayesian estimate of trophic position. But right now we're just going to do it using this quick and easy and quick and dirty two source mixing model approach. And essentially we know trophic position is 15N of the consumer. Or trophic position of the baseline plus 15N of the consumer minus 15N of the baseline divided by our fractionation value. But because we've got two sources, we need to include or we need to also incorporate the relative contribution of each source. So we've got D15N of base one by contribution of base one, D15N of base two by contribution of base two. And essentially what we're doing is we're combining this mixing model, typically that value that we get for, um, for resource use, we term that as alpha. So we've got source one by alpha plus um, one or source two by one minus alpha. We'll talk about that in class. So here we just this is essentially how we how we write this TP of the um, of the baseline is TP2 because we're looking at secondary consumers or our fish here are secondary consumers. We then have um, 15N essentially just picking up those columns, adding that into the into the code. Press go. I'm just going to run through this box entirely. And what this is going to tell us is again very similar to what we see in the actual nitrogen 15N values that our trophic position here is in Lake Kiwi. Big difference in trophic position between perch and whitefish where the perch we've got this large tail half the population are kind of up here at a higher trophic position. Lake Vuontas pretty similar trophic position. Something that's interesting with sort of touch in on later on is the fact that there's such a big baseline difference here. Overall in Lake Kiwi, we're around about almost one trophic position higher than Lake Vontas. And 
I'm going to leave that there as a, as a question to you guys as to sort of what's causing that. Um, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier when I talked about the limitations of how we've chosen the baselines, um, but I'll, I'll leave that as a teaser, as a teaser hint, and we can hopefully circle back in on that during the discussions. Okay, so that's a very quick and easy way to estimate trophic position. And again, if we look at our MN data table now, what we've got is estimate of pelagic resource use for each individual and an estimate of trophic position for each individual. So again, if you're interested in modeling what's influencing trophic position, there you go. You now have your dependent variable and you can run that into your model. Yeah. Okay, so running back to this, Again, the last sort of thing we want to focus in on here before we stop this video is the fact that we're now able to do essentially ecologically relevant by plots. And we can just press this here and let this run through and I'll show you what I mean. That instead of plotting out carbon and nitrogen values, we're now able to plot out estimates of resource use and trophic position. And we can see here the Kiwi, Lake Fuentes. Again, everywhere the zooplankton here are pretty much on, on one because that's our pelagic end member. And then we've got a load of individuals here which are down near zero that because we corrected, they were the negatives. But again, what we're seeing here at Lake Kiwi, predominantly littoral driven, not much, oh, excuse me, not much pelagic components, certainly to the, the fish community. And we've got some fish, some outliers fish that, that are feeding out there. So that's again, really, really important, really interesting. We look at Lake Fuentes, almost the inverse, that there's everything is far more closer towards the, the pelagic component, but we do see some fish here are split being more associated with the littoral, but a far more important pelagic influence on the overall fish community. Scroll down and let's look at our species of interest. And again, what we're seeing here, pelagic resource use and trophic position rather than the 13C and 15M and separation and trophic position. Some of these perch up here are feeding at a higher trophic level than some of the perch down there. Some of uh, the whitefish, or we've got some overlap here between whitefish and perch, but for the most part, the whitefish here are clustered around high pelagic resource use, whereas the perch here are more littoral. And in Lake Kivi here, the perch are definitely predominantly littoral. Both species are littoral. Um, Okay, so what's this telling us? It's telling us a couple of things. We see an ontogenetic shift, what I'm going to term an ontogenetic shift, or what is termed an ontogenetic shift in the perch. Larger perch are, well, actually, we shouldn't be saying that. We know some of the perch are um, piscivorous. So what we need to do is to plot trophic position against fork length and body mass for, for those fish and see how that plots out. I can, I, I can tell you because I've looked at these data for quite a while, that larger perch will be more, uh, we're feeding at a higher trophic level. Okay, so this is a really nice intro. Um, we can sort of run down through this, took us what, an hour or so, through all these little videos combined, and get some really nice inferences of, from, of ecology within these systems from our isotope data. There's a lot of limitations to this approach, so particularly around how we're handling variance in the baselines. We haven't really talked about how we handle um, fractionation values in this. It's built into the it's built into the equations, but again, we don't have any estimate of variance on those fractionation values. So we get really good data. Well, there's a whole host of assumptions that are behind those data that are probably not being met. Um, how we handle those is what we're going to deal with in the next couple of lectures, where we're going to talk about um, mixing models using the, the SIMR and Mixire, and trophic position calculations using the trophic position package, and then we'll work on by the end of the week and we'll be talking about isotopic niches and things like that.
Okay, so I'm going to bring back this up. Let's back up here. Sorry, I'm just talking. Okay, there we go. I'm going to stop recording.